y'all are acting like it's early in the morning. Yeah, this is the late service, y'all. Y'all should be well rested. How are you? Good morning. Is can we can we re- just start over? How you doing? Are y'all happy to come to church? Or are you like not this guy again? Tell me which way we're gonna go today. <laughs> Either way, this is what you get. Um, So that ought to tell you how much the Lord loves you. Um, He does. He's so good. We actually launched Great Oaks Fellowship last week. Were you here for that? Um, We as a church have been here for the last eight years, and we were Grace Point Church. And um, man, it was just a blessed time. God did a ton of work here. Um, But sometimes there's new seasons that God presents. And so three years ago, Pastor Jeff, who was the pastor over Grace Point Medical and Grace Point West, which is this church, um, reached out to me in Colorado and said, hey, man, we knew each other. I used to serve at at the other congregation years ago as a youth pastor. And he said that basically, he said, man, and we're looking to really see this church become its own entity, we feel it's time that it's mature enough, it's established to be able to do that. And I'd love for you to consider and pray about being a part of that. And so obviously the answer was yes. Uh, once the Lord, we fasted, we prayed, we sought the Lord, and we moved our family from Colorado back down to San Antonio, where I was raised, and uh, to lead this church. And so last Sunday was the fulfillment of that of that vision that J- Pastor Jeff had. And I want to honor him. I'm so thankful for him. And uh, man, he could have called anybody, but he called me, and I'm really grateful grateful for that. But here's the thing. We didn't change the name. It is a declaration of who we are. And it's very important for us to know that because to change a name and to change a logo is to be like a, a, a restaurant. That's not what restu- that's what restaurants do. This is reflective of what God has called us to enter into. And the call of God on this house is rooted in Isaiah 61. And so when we see that, when we exchange our ashes, when we exchange our captivity for freedom, forgiveness, and a crown of beauty, according to scripture, it says that he plants us as great oaks of righteousness for his glory. So every time you pass by this church and every time you pull into this parking lot, when you see great oaks, look at that sign and be reminded that's what God says you are. And we're about to enter into a new season. So that's the vision for the church is Isaiah 61. But you need a mission statement to kind of get your mind around from a day to day, step by step aspect to be able to know how to live out this vision. You can have a vision, but if you don't have a mission, you can't get there. And the Lord put on our hearts the way that we will do that is through this method and through this means of understanding. So I want you to read it out loud, out loud with me, all right? This is an opportunity for you to change my opinion of you guys right now. All right. So read it out loud with me. This is our mission statement. We exist to say yes to Jesus in every area of our lives. That's it. When we do this, you will begin to see life. You will begin to see the ashes of things in your life be exchanged for the beauty of God. Then you will begin to see that your home changes. You will begin to see your city is transformed. You will begin to see that your impact through your yes, your yes, And our collective yes can reach the nations because part of what Isaiah 61 talks about is us actually participating with foreigners to till the soil and take care of the land. There is such an amazing call of God on this house and I want us to be able to enter into it. And the only way that it can is not because you have a pastor that's excited about it. It's if we make the decision to say yes to Jesus in every area of our lives. Amen. All right. Don't make me have to solicit another amen. All right. Um, So with that said, I'm feisty today. With that said, we are starting a brand new series to kind of talk about what this looks like to say yes to Jesus in every area of our lives. And so the name of the series is going to be Our Best Yes. Our Best Yes. What are you giving your yes to? The thing is, is our yes has tremendous power in it. Because you hold the power of yes in your hand. I'm telling you, I'll speak for myself, I have given my yes, my best yes to things that gave me my worst heartaches. Have you? There is tremendous power when we say yes to the right things or the wrong things. It determines what our life will ultimately look like. When we say yes to ice cream twice a day, your yes will reveal that self and the manifestation of that, right? I was talking to a buddy of mine this past week. I was having lunch with him, and we we're talking about working out. I was like, dude, I'm getting back. This is my first week back in the gym. And I said, uh, he said, well, you look kind of slim. I'm like, nah, dude, this is all smoke and mirrors. It's a nightmare under here. He's like, no, you look all right. I'm like, no, dude, I have the physique of a hot dog. And I need to fix that right now. Why? Because over sabbatical, instead of getting in the gym and taking care of my health, 
I did the opposite. I gave my yes to Mexican food and chips and salsa and all the wrong things. And now my yes is showing me, it's showing the manifestation of that. But what we say yes to really does determine what your life turns out to be. That's a pretty powerful consideration. The thing is, it's not what you say no to that matters as much as your yes. We think that as Christians, we're taught to say no to things. No, it's actually what you say yes to is what makes a bigger difference because in every yes that you give, your no is already baked into it. Let me ask you, but let me put it this way. When you got saved, did you get saved because you said no to the devil or yes to Jesus? You see what I'm saying? It's when we say yes to things, that's where the power is at. The no was already baked in. We didn't say no to the devil to get saved. We said yes to Jesus to get saved. And so let's consider the power of our yes. That's what we're talking about in this series. And so we're going to look at some folks who did it really well in Scripture. We're going to look at a couple of knuckleheads that didn't do it that great at all. I being one of those knuckleheads in my past, but we're all here. And so I'm going to open up with one of my favorite passages to preach from. I think this is the third time I've preached on this passage. But the Lord has just given me a new perspective on this one that I hadn't seen before. But it's in Mark chapter 5. And so if you have your Bibles, pull out your notebooks, get your pens, be great note takers, and let the Lord show you the map and what it means to say yes to him wherever you are this morning. All right? So let's pray. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to say yes to you, God, in this moment. I truly do. I want to see what you want to do uniquely for this 1130 service. The individuals that are watching online, those that are in this room, those who are listening to the podcast, God, you know where they're at and where they need to say yes to you next. Make it easy. Empower us. And may we be faithful to give you our best yes in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Mark chapter 5, it opens with Jesus getting in a boat and he's going to cross over from Galilee, Tiberias, and he's going to go over to this place called the Gerasenes. It's a region. And so if you could see the, the, the Sea of Galilee, it's shaped like a horseshoe. And so if you're standing on this side and you're looking this direction, over here would be Tiberias. Straight ahead is Capernaum, which is where Jesus lived. And then you have the Gerasenes over here. The Gerasenes are like this kind of a pagan culture. They don't, they don't align with Jewish culture. They don't have an interest in that. They've adopted a lot of Greek beliefs and systems and philosophies of living. Um, they're raising pigs, which in Jewish culture at the time was considered super unclean. They, let me put it this way. On this side, Jewish culture. Jesus is a Jew. He was raised in Jewish culture. And so we would see that if we're standing on this side and looking over at the Gerasenes, we would go, this is us and that is them. Us and them. Sound familiar, guys? Right? The ballot box. Us, them. Right? Sports teams. Us, them. We, we love creating separation and categories because it makes us feel safe. It makes us feel a little bit better than them. And so this is kind of the culture that's taking place. So Jesus leaves us and goes across the great gulf of the Sea of Galilee to go to them. Why? Well, we're about to find out. So he takes his boat, goes across, and he just arrived. And in verse 2, look at what happens. Right out of the chute. This is crazy and amazing all at the same time. Jesus climbed out of the boat, and a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. Y'all catch that? <laughs> When you go to a new city and you pull up to the La Quinta Inn and it's 11 o'clock at night and you're, you've been traveling all day, is that what you want greeting you when you show up? Some demon-possessed guy there running out of a cemetery, welcome to Amarillo, you know what I mean? But let me stop here for a second because there's so much to this verse that maybe we're not seeing yet. The thing is, is I believe there's those listening to this on some level who can relate to this guy. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. Maybe in this season of your life, you found yourself living in a place surrounded by dead things. Dead relationships, dead dreams, dead hopes. There are some of us in here where you feel that God's calling and purpose on your life, because you gave your yes in previous seasons to the wrong things, you feel that God's purpose for your life has also died. And you feel like, you're, man, you're just trying to just keep it together until you go to heaven. Listen, I have lived in that place of the dead. I know what it's like to experience death like that. And to be surrounded by it is so hopeless because you can't do anything with the dead thing. And dead things decompose and then they blow away. 
This is the life that this man is leading, and I believe some of us in here are also in that same spot. Let's keep on going. Verse 2, though, it says Jesus pulled up in his boat, though. So he goes to this place where it is them. They don't believe the right things. They don't act the right way. There's the uncleanly. It's, it's just not a place that you would naturally want to go unless you're Jesus. And you see something in those people that other people on the other side couldn't see. Bad people. But Jesus says people that need to be saved. He gets in his boat. And then once he gets out, the man is now presented with a choice. So Jesus is getting out of the boat. He hasn't said anything. We don't see any conversation like, hey, come here. Jesus is over there. The man is in the cemetery, but now he's got a choice to make. What we have to understand is the guy lives in the cemetery. That's what we're about to see. Not only does he live in the cemetery, but we're also going to find out that he is naked. He has no clothes on. As my mom would say, he's naked as a jaybird. I don't know what that means, but that sounds pretty naked to me. And I'm glad that none of us are jaybirds this morning. Thank you for doing the, protecting us from that. But this guy is a pariah in his town. He's, he's chained to the ashes of where he's given his yes, and the results of giving his yes to the wrong things have put him in the cemetery. And in spite of that, though, he makes a choice to get out of the cemetery as he was in the state that he's in to go to Jesus. I want those in here who feel like you're too broken, you're too far gone, you've said yes to so many things, to the wrong things, that you don't feel, I'm here to tell you something. Our first yes to Jesus allows us to come to him just as we are. Am I dreaming that this is happening or is this hitting, I mean, is this like, do you hear what I'm saying? We can come to him just as we are. Let me put it this way. We're raised, like when we get up and when we get raised up, our parents, when it's time to get a job and it's the, maybe the first important job, what did you do before you went to that job interview? You bought a new outfit, you bought yourself a tie, you got yourself some high heels, I don't know, whatever it is that you put on and you go there and you're presenting your best self. Why? So that you could be approved. You want to be approved of, you want to be accepted, you want that thing, and in order to get that, you want to present your best self. That's what we're taught. That's good, right? If you want to go on that first date, what do you do? You take showers, you use deodorant, you brush your teeth, you buy a new shirt, you do whatever you need to do to look awesome, especially if you want to have a second date with that person, right? And I'm afraid, though, the problem is, though, is that same line of thinking and these principles transfer over into a context like this is the problem. And so many people, and maybe you even think that, man, you got to clean yourself up to even come into this room. And you need to put on a different version of what you really are so you can feel like you could be accepted here. I can't speak for other churches, but I'm here to tell you, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you got to get your stuff together and look a certain way and act a certain way in order to be accepted here. Here's the thing. There is no spiritual dress code for you to come in this place. You can come just as you are. Now, I understand what that means because that statement has hooks in it. And we, some people are going, well, see, I knew it was one of those kind of churches. Yeah, we're one of those kind of churches where we want people to come in here and hear about Jesus because they don't know him. You can't get mad at the dead person for being dead. They're dead. What do you want? They stink. They rot. They're, they're not something that is appealing. Lord, bring them here. Bring them here so that we can point them to the reality that Jesus pulls his boat up into people's lives that don't deserve to have their boat pulled up on. Right? Now, in the 10 o'clock, I got a rousing applause on that. But I'm, I'm going to forgive you for that. That's all right. No, no, no problem. We're, we're just going to move on. But <laughs> this is what I told them, though. They, they were like, really? Yeah, that's right. And I'm like, yeah, we're all excited until next week. Someone's going to sit next to you. Then what are you going to do then when they don't look the right way, they don't act the right way? Maybe they got a different type of attire on or they're presenting themselves in a way that you go, what in the heck are they doing here? They is not they, it's us. As the kids say, I want all the smoke. I want every single bit of those who don't feel they can walk through any doors of any church to understand by the power of the Holy Spirit, they can come in here and hear the gospel just like you heard the gospel at some point in your life and said yes to Jesus. Amen. That's the second amen I've had to solicit. All right, let's keep on going. 
But the, <laughs> anyway, so let's look at how desperate this man's life is. I'm having fun with you guys. Y'all will catch up. It'll be good. It'll be good. But this is kind of an intense sermon at the same time, and I am aware of that as well. The conviction, I think, of the Holy Spirit is very strong in this room this morning, and it needs to be. But I want us to look at what happens in verse 3. Scripture pulls the curtain back and actually gives us a picture to see just how terrible and hopeless this man's life is. Look at this. It says, the man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. This means there's folks who are running to Home Depot on a consistent basis to buy chains to try to subdue this guy because he's out of control. He, they're, they're afraid of this guy. They don't know what else to do with him. It goes on to say, though, it doesn't work, though. The problem is, it says, is whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. And no one, no one, the mayor, the dude's dad, his best friend, his dog, no one could subdue this guy. And I want to point this out because when our world sees brokenness, when religion sees brokenness, their first response and only response is to chain people down with more rules, more laws, more regulations, to be able to chain someone down and force them to behave in the way that they think they should. That's what religion does, and that is what our culture does, because they don't know what else to do with that problem. The problem is, is if chaining people down was the answer, then why in the world doesn't it work? As a matter of fact, if chaining people down with more laws, more regulations, more policies, more of this, if it actually worked, then we wouldn't honestly need Jesus. We found a chain big enough to be able to handle the problem ourselves. But a broken person breaks chains, but they're still in bondage. That's the situation here. Now listen, I'm about to step on some toes further, okay? If you're new here, please know that I preach in, with truth and love. It's because I love you guys, but more than me, God loves you. And he wants you to walk in the fullness of truth. And so discipline, <laughs> the Bible says, is not pleasant at the time, but is intended to produce greater righteousness in our lives. Here's what I think the Lord wanted me to, it's not thinking, the Lord told me to say this, so I'm going to say it. If the world and religion goes, the way that I'm going to fix this bad person is by putting chains on them, right? Why do people who say they're saved do the same thing? Let me explain. Christians, not all, but Christians look at those people on the other side of the lake and they go, they just need to stop it. They need to quit it. Right? They need to stop having that sort of attraction. Stop it. They say, you know what? You need to stop dressing that way. Quit it. You need to stop identifying as that. Stop it. Christians are saying that stuff. And it feels so good and righteous to be able to point that out. And we feel like we've really done something special. And all we did is identify the obvious. But here's what I want to tell you. Is that how you got saved? Just by quitting stuff? Because if that's how you think you got saved, you're not saved. Because the Bible says that any effort to quit anything in an attempt to save ourselves is called dead works. So you're actually just chaining yourself down, but your destiny hasn't changed. We can't do that because it's like, here's the thing, telling a broken person to quit it Telling a broken person to stop it is like telling a person with cancer terminally, just take an aspirin, just stop, just take an aspirin. We would never do that. So why wouldn't we understand that the disease of a heart is the eternally diseased? It was born diseased. Why would we look at a diseased heart and just go, nah, you just need to take an aspirin? We would never say that. But that's what's going on in broken people. So guys, I'm here to tell you, a politician, a pastor, a policy, our best efforts to be good can never fix the core issue of brokenness. Behavior modification on its best day is just a band-aid on an infected wound. It doesn't do anything but make an attempt to barely cover it up so it's not as unsightly to other people. 
But here's the thing. As we see proven in this man's life, it's even worse than what we just heard. Because look at how he lives his days and his nights. It says day and night he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills. He's howling, it says, and cutting himself with sharp stones. This guy, at one point, looked like one of the little babies we saw dedicated up here a minute ago. We only see him as he is today. But he didn't start out that way. But through a series of certain yeses in his life, it has led him to this place of desperation and brokenness. And what he's doing, he's by himself. And I think some of you can relate. You're not sleeping at night. You're wandering the, the, your bedroom, the halls of your house, just going, God, why, why can I get, now why am I in this torment? How can, I, how can I get out from this? And what this guy does, he's in so much pain and so much desperation that he actually hurts himself further to get his mind off the deeper wound that hurts more. You catch that? So he's already in pain, and this is what we're all tempted to do when we are in places of woundedness. We look to alcohol, we look to pornography, we look to people's approvals, or we will do things that are, we know are self-destructive behaviors is what my point is. For what purpose? We know it's self-destructive, but at least it's a different type of pain that gets our mind off the real pain that we're trying to escape. That's what this man is dealing with, and some of you are absolutely in that place this morning. But Jesus, everybody say, but Jesus. You see, look at what happens in verse 6. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, and he ran to meet Jesus, and he bowed low before him. Do you see? There's nothing at this point where he goes, I'm so sorry for my appearance. I really should have cleaned up my act first. But I don't. No, he just goes, and he bows at the feet of Jesus. And what if it was that easy for you this morning to find deliverance from the pain that you're in? No words, no fancy prayer. Giving your best yes to Jesus starts with bowing at his feet going, here I am. If you can clean this mess, I will let you. You now have my yes. But let's skip to verse 8 before we look at verse 7. Because what Jesus says, he says now he, the man is down at his feet. Jesus looks at him and he says, come out of that man, you evil spirit. Notice Jesus doesn't address the dude's behaviors, his appearance, or his choices. Jesus is able to identify the core issue, and the core issue is not the external behaviors or appearance. It is the issue of his heart is the real problem. So Jesus doesn't care about the externals. Those are symptoms of an illness. We got to stop worrying about the symptoms of people's illnesses and understand that comes from a place of brokenness and pain. And so Jesus goes, that's the problem. Well, when he identifies the problem... The real issue is that darkness has set up residence in this man's spirit. He has allowed himself to be exposed to certain things that have now manifested and taken territory in his life. This is why he is the way he is. And with the shriek, this is what he screams back. Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. It's not the dude talking. It's the evil spirits in him. The devil is a liar. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We know that. But here's one thing that you may not know. The devil understands authority. He does. The moment the king of kings and the lord of lords shows up, these demons start saying, you're the son of God. We already know how this is going to go. We already know this. We already know. Please don't inter Why are you interfering with us? Why is that the response? The reason why those demons are saying, why are you interfering with us and what we're doing? we got a good thing going in this man's life. Why are you messing with us? Because this man's darkness is now being exposed by the light of Jesus. And they're going, ah, oh, we can't take it. The reason why is because darkness hates light. That's why even right now as I preach, some of you, you have voices in your head and in your heart, and they're saying, they're trying to outshout me right now. All of a sudden, your phone just started texting from people, and you're like, man, I'm, I'm trying to listen to this, and you're responding back. All of a sudden, you're tuning out, and you're thinking about, man, I'm, I'm kind of hungry. What am I going to eat afterward? Don't mistake what's going on here. Because the light of God and the preaching of the word of God is now shining into your heart. 
Why are you interfering with us? Why is that a big deal? Why does the devil care? The reason why is because the power of your secrets, the power of your sins, the power of your brokenness can only have power when it's hidden in the dark. The moment it is exposed to the light of God, it loses its power. But right there, we go, oh my gosh, if I ever shared that secret, my spouse would leave me. David, if I ever shared these sins, I I don't think I would even be allowed to come back in this church. Oh my gosh, if I talked about this area of brokenness in my life, you can hear the voices that go, everyone would see the real you. Right? That is a threat of fear to keep you in the dark. Because those things only have power when they're hidden in the dark. The moment the light shines on them, they lose their power, which is why there's a war taking place right now. When we expose these things and let them be revealed, there's freedom. And we're about to see that take place. You see, you have to understand what Scripture says. In John, it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not have the power to extinguish it. So when you have the light of Christ come into your life, yes, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so exposed and and there's this war going on wanting to hold on to this territory. But listen, let me tell you something. We can have freedom when we allow the light of Christ to truly penetrate our lives. But then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he responded back, my name is Legion because there are many of us inside this man. So he's got demons, plural, in them. Why did he ask, what's your name? Is Jesus wanting to introduce himself? Hey, what's your name? What is he really doing there? I believe the reason why he's identifying who this demon is, or these legion of demons, is because because behind our brokenness, guys, is a broken identity. Your brokenness, that's not where it starts. That's not where that's not the bottom floor. Under your brokenness is a broken identity. The problem is, is that when we allow that broken identity to just stay within us, it becomes our identity. And we go, this is what I am. This is who I am. This is why I do and say the things I, do you see what I'm saying? Do you see the deceit and the destruction? It is impossible to give your best yes to God when you won't allow him to define you. To say yes to Jesus, though, is to exchange our old identities of brokenness and shame and disease and death for a new one in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 says, starting in verse 17, we are new creations in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. And from that, we become ambassadors for Christ in which we now get to plead to those who are still in brokenness, come back to God. For God who never sinned became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of Christ, meaning we become whole, we become restored, we become new. But the brokenness has to go. But behind all brokenness is a broken identity. But things are about to get intense. You think it's already been intense? Oh no, dude, you don't even know what's going on. Verse 10, look at what happens. The evil spirits begged them again and again not to send them to some distant place. Okay, put a pin in that. We're going to visit that here in a second. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on a hillside nearby. And they go, send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter into them. Why why is location and moving addresses so important? I want you to hear this. Because the enemy, because the enemy understands authority, he also understands dominion and strongholds and territories. Let me give you an example. If you're driving down I-10, you could see a church on the side of the highway, but there's also the Hustler Novelties and Gift Shop, right? You can drive to any part of town, and when you begin to start seeing more pawn shops, more liquor stores, you start seeing prostitution, you start seeing trafficking, you start seeing violence, murders, shootings. Do you think that just happens because they're just bad people? No. There's strongholds. There's strongholds that the enemy has been allowed to take root and dominance in. They're about territory. This is why some of you, your homes are not peaceful. There's a spirit of contentiousness and stress 
and infighting and bickering. This could be why there's a cloud of depression, not all the time, hear me out, but let's not discount it either. A pall over your house, where you walk in there, it's supposed to be a place of rest, but it's a place of torment. Why? I don't know. But I would encourage you to consider what you're allowing into the house that is taking dominance and taking that territory. Because that's not reflective of a spirit-filled home. Now, I'm not saying we're not going to have issues and arguments and tiffs. Goodness knows, Sarah and I are poster children for that. But here's the thing. We, we identify it, though. We go, hold on. There's something in this house that is not of God. This is not the way God's house would look. I would encourage you to consider what shows you're watching on TV. I know I sound like my dad. He was a preacher. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. When you're watching that Starsky and Hutch, you know. Um, <laughs> but I'm saying if you're, if you're watching programming that has violence, death, taking God's name in vain, you're inviting that stuff in. When you're viewing pornography, We think the problem is seeing the flesh and people doing things with no clothes on, but the reality is that is only a distraction. I want you to hear me and understand this. That is a distraction to get you focused on this, but that is a portal to hell because what comes through that portal is nothing sexual. Depression, spirit of suicide, any other demonic force that can destroy your life is coming through those outlets. Would you get mad at a criminal if you left your house this morning and left the windows and doors open and then you came home and found everything gone? Would you get mad at the criminal or mad at yourself? The answer is you would be mad at yourself. It's not the criminal's fault. You left the door wide open, you left your windows open, and you you left the house unattended, and then you're mad because everything got stolen? Why do we leave the door and the windows open to our lives and just no, what, and just the devil just comes and goes and steals, kills, and destroys left and right, and we're just like, I don't, I'm just under attack. No, you don't know how to protect your heart. You don't know how to protect your home. You don't know how to protect your marriage. The devil wants your territory because it's domination and it is established. And it, the enemy is fighting for that. Okay, so Jesus give them permission to leave. The evil spirits come out of the man. They go into 2,000 pigs. Those 2,000 pigs, guess what they do? They jump off the cliff and they die. Why did they do that? Because any time an evil spirit is involved in anything living, the only thing that evil spirit can produce is death, not life. There's no way any of those pigs could have ever thrived or had any type of life because they're now possessed with death destruction. So when we allow that into our life and we give our yes to these things, understand we're saying yes to death. The herdsmen freak out. They go to the villages nearby. They share these stories. People rush out to see what happens. A a, a crowd soon gathers because, yeah, of course it would. If I told you, hey, guys, between services, there's 2,000 pigs that jumped off the bridge on 1604 right in front of our church. We'd be like, okay, we need to pause this service and go see those pigs, right? It's a spectacle. That's what's happening here. And so they're beginning to like, this man was demon-possessed, but now the pigs are dead and the demons are flying out and all the rest of the stuff. All the while, look who's sitting there perfectly and fully clothed perfectly sane, and it's then everybody gets afraid. That's, that's so weird to me. Hold on. Not when he was naked in a cemetery eating people's faces off. It's when he looks like one of us, now we all get afraid. What's the problem? The problem is, is that we, many people in our lives, when we receive Christ, just simply don't understand what's happened. And we can't make sense of it. And so fear of, hey, you're not the way that you used to be. Hey, man, how come you don't come to the parties anymore? Hey, man, how come you, hey, well, how come you don't do this? How come you don't participate in that? And we try to, Jesus saved me. Oh, that's weird, man. That freaks me out. I don't, I don't understand that. That's what's taking place here. But there's something else going on as well. You see, what we have to understand is this man was found living in the place of the dead, naked, with no hope, but now he's fully clothed. He has his full mental capacities back, and he is completely redeemed and restored. You see, guys, what we got to understand is this. Jesus came to save people who have no right to become Christians. That's who Jesus came to save. And so to say yes to Jesus Guys, this morning is to exchange our shame and our nakedness for the clothing of salvation and God's robe of righteousness on us. But what we have to remember is that this exchange did not come without a price and a cost. What Jesus did is he swapped places with us. 
What Jesus did is he became naked so that you could be clothed. What I'm talking about is when Jesus went to the cross, the way Roman crucifixion worked is that they would strip the person fully nude. Jesus did not have a loincloth on. He was completely naked, strapped onto a cross for the whole world to see. It was intended to shame and demean while they torture and kill. That is what the crucifixion was. Jesus became naked on your behalf so you wouldn't have to. But then Jesus actually went into the cemetery on your behalf and was buried in the place among the dead. On the third day when he rose from the dead, he walked out of the cemetery. And because Jesus walked out of the cemetery, we get to as well, just like the demon-possessed guy. With a robe of righteousness, no shame, victory over death. That's what Jesus has done for us. He became naked and dead so that we wouldn't have to. Isn't he good? This is why Isaiah 61 says, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God. Why? He's dressed us with the clothing of salvation. He's draped us in the robe of righteousness. We are like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewels. Jesus just doesn't cover us with a trash bag or a burlap sack. He gives us his robe of righteousness, his clothing of salvation. That's how you're dressed this morning if you're in Christ, if you've said yes to him. But look what happens. Those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and the crowd began to plead with Jesus to go away. Jesus is not going to force himself on you. I think it's kind of tragic because what if he was there to do that for everybody that was in that area? But they didn't understand it, and quite honestly, the light of the Lord was shining on their areas of brokenness, and they're like, not cool. You need to leave now. You're treading on personal things that you have no place to even address. So Jesus leaves. It's it's what happens. So he's in the boat. But the man who had been demon-possessed says, I want to go with you. But Jesus says, no, here's what I'd rather you do. Go to your family and tell them everything that the Lord has done for you and how merciful he's been to you. Then look what this guy does. He goes to the region, the ten towns, and that begins to proclaim the great things that the Lord had done for them. And as he went and shared his testimony, people were amazed by what he shared with them. What does this tell us? What it tells us is to say yes to Jesus, guys. This demon-possessed guy is now teaching us the value of what it means to share Christ with people. He's our teacher this morning through the power of the Holy Spirit. To say yes to Jesus is to accept the call to show others how they too can say yes to Jesus. Because to say yes to Jesus is not only to receive from him salvation, but then it it means that we are now positioned to have him work through us so others can find salvation. We are called to let the world know that you don't have to be naked and afraid anymore. Our call of God on the house is Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on us. For he has anointed us, for those of us who have accepted Christ, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent us to comfort the brokenhearted. He has sent us to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners freed. He has sent us to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, to all who mourn in San Antonio, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness they will be like great oaks. God wants to plant more than what's represented in this room. And they will be planted for his own glory. This is our future. But it cannot happen if I'm the only one who's excited and obedient in this area. This is our job. So the truth is, is that I, but there's three groups of people this morning that I want to talk to. The first group are those who understood what I'm about to share in Romans, and it's this. We understand, go on and put that up, please. Nope. Let's put that verse up. There we go. (laughs) Nope. Please go back. We're going to get there. There we go. Stick on 13. We all understand this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Okay. We understand that. I quote that all the time. But verse 14 has something interesting it's asking of us, those of us who have said yes to the Lord. How can they... The people on the other side, that's not like us. 
How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in Jesus if they've never heard about him? How can they hear about Jesus unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news of Jesus. So here's where we're at. Most of us in here have been egregiously disobedient to the Lord in this area when it comes to sharing Christ with people around us. There's no excuse for it, and there's no option to not do it. To say yes to Jesus today is to say yes to sharing the gospel with those around you in your circles of influence. But David, I don't know what to say. I'm freaking out. I don't know. I understand. But at the core of what your anxiety produces as someone who understands it, it's just pride. We don't want to hear the word no, do we? We don't want to feel rejected. We don't want to be laughed at at work, right? We don't want to be presented with an argument. We don't want to get into a fight with people. And so we hear all these reasons to keep us shut up about it. That's the devil, and that's pride, because we don't like the way it makes us feel if we were to try to do that, so we don't. That's disobedience. That's not giving your yes to God. But there are those in this room this morning, the second group I want to talk to is the Lord has saved you. And you have been redeemed. And you have tasted and seen for yourself that the Lord is good. But in this season, for some reason or another, you begin to give your yes back to places where the cemetery is. And you've invited little sins through your yes and big sins through your yes maybe. And you're saved. But nowhere in Scripture do we see this guy ever going back to the place where he was. But some of you are today. And you are dabbling in things that are going to produce death in your life. I say that because I love you. But you can't blame God and get mad at him and go, why did God do this to me? No, our yes has power. Scripture says it is better for someone to have never said yes to Jesus at any point than to have tasted salvation and go back to death. Scripture says it is like a dog going back to his vomit. But the third group of people in here, you're like, I want to get saved. I'm tired of the cemetery. I want to walk in new life. I want to be restored. I want to know Jesus. Well, then the Bible says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. So will you stand to your feet? Please stand to your feet. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you at the count of three, if you want to get saved today, to come up here to the front, and I want to lead you through a prayer. As a physical response, just like the demon-possessed guy did, he had to come as he was physically to respond to the message and the salvation of Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you to do that at the count of three. If you want to be saved this morning and delivered, get out of the cemetery and come up front. And I want to pray with you. One, two, three. Please come up. Please come up. And every Sunday or every service, there's this people start gripping onto the back of that seat like they're about to fall through the floor. And I understand why. But bro, God bless you. Come on up, dude. <laughs> Who else? Who else? Who wants to get saved today? What type of tragedy would it be for you to come to church and see an opportunity for eternal life and salvation and let fear keep you from experiencing the very thing you came here to get? So I'm going to give you a couple more seconds. If you need to bring a friend with you, then come up and do that. But don't leave here without getting saved. Come on. God bless you both. Come on. Who else? Is there anybody else in here? This is for you. It's not for my ego. But God bless you guys. Anybody else? Anybody else? It's not too late. Well, you know what? God bless you guys. And I, and I don't want to make a show out of this. This is between you and the Lord, okay? So... The Bible says that if we pray and confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, okay? So what's about to take place is not the prayer that saves you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but God is looking at the sincerity of your heart, but I want to let you know something. Every single thing that you feel broken about that has been torturing you because of your past decisions, even as young and amazing as you are and you, the truth is, is for all of you, the cross is going to say forgiven. 
you're going to leave it here at the altar, at the cross of Christ, okay? So I want you to pray with me right now. Just repeat after me, dear Jesus. Just tell it to him, okay? Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. But right now, with the faith that you've given me, I put it in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead on the third day. And that you want to save me. So I'm asking you to save me now. Make me a new creation. Covered by your blood. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I will make you the Lord and boss of my life. In Jesus' name. And for you guys who just prayed that, I, do you feel it? You feel it? The burdens and chains are falling off. I can sense it from you guys. I can sense it. I want you right now to begin to thank him for what he just did for you. Begin to thank him right now just in your own way. This is not a show for you guys. Can we just encourage our brand new brothers and sisters in Christ? God bless you, bro. God bless you. Our, our prayer team wants to connect with you. We want to give you a Bible. We want to talk to you and celebrate the decision that you just made, guys. But I want to celebrate that with you. God bless you guys. God bless you. So what, go follow our prayer team, and they're going to connect with you. Okay, guys? We have such amazing leaders that are willing to invest. <sighs> Don't you just love what God does? Don't you just love it? <laughs> so, um, so with that said, um, we need to be prayerful about how we can now go and share the gospel. That's just the bottom line. So the Lord has put names and faces on your heart. And the Lord wants you to begin to pray for opportunities and the ability to have the guts to be able to open up your mouth and share the gospel, okay? Those names and faces are there. I don't see them, but you see them, which means God's told you uniquely who those people are. Begin to pray for them and pray for opportunities. Don't worry about what you're going to say. All you need to do is give your yes in that moment to Jesus, and he will take your clunky words and empower them with the power of the gospel because he's looking for any child who is actually going to obey him in this area to use. Don't worry about whether they reject you or not. Has, you don't own the results, but we do own our yes, don't we? You own your yes, you let him handle everything else. Cool? I love you. I love you too, Pastor David. Mm. Thank you so much. Anyway, I love you guys. Next week is going to be a great week. Bring your friends, and I can't wait to see what he's going to do in your lives. See you next week.